So one of the things that we focus on is getting inventors to understand there are easier ways to do that than getting into the widget business. And one of those is licensing. Licensing your idea, your proven idea often, most of the time, to a company who is already in the business side of things. Because that's the part where you're going to fail. That's the part where you're going to drag your family down. That's the part where this thing goes south quickly. In licensing, we recognize the fact that when we walk out of the shed, we're done. We're going to hand it to somebody else and let them run down the road that they know and we're going to go back to the shed and do something else. And that's really, really important. So, what's the definition of product licensing? The process of allowing a company or individual to use, rent, or otherwise lease the developed or undeveloped, patented or unpatented product or idea. Now this is really important. Developed or undeveloped, patented or unpatented product or idea in exchange for the consideration of royalties. That is licensing. In a nutshell. These are the two biggest myths to licensing. You can't license an unprotected idea to a manufacturer, totally garbage. And a fully developed product is worth more, more garbage. Best we can tell, less than 20% of retail products have any patent protection whatsoever. If myth number one were true, our shelves would be empty. We've been awarding patents since the late 1700s. It is very difficult to get patent protection on most retail products because it's already been given out. Because most of what we invent today is a better way of doing something we invented a long time ago. A fully developed product is not worth more in a licensing deal because the, that's the business they're in of developing products. So why would I want to go and license my container full of stuff in the backyard to a company? All they're going to do is redo it using their knowledge and experience, which is significantly more than our knowledge and experience. So let's let them do what they do. These two things drive a lot of what inventors are spending money on. Step one, refer back to what you learned about how to invent and what makes a good product. Oh, refer back to what? Refer back to your education. Remember, you're going to get in this and you're going to do this. It's your responsibility to know what makes a good product. I hear this all the time. Oh, Mr. Ryan, how do you get a company to pay attention to your product? Well, that's easy. Have a good product. They will beat themselves up getting to you. I promise. Because their machine is insatiable. It never quits eating. But it's picky about what it wants to eat. So the onus is on you to understand what makes a good product. You have to learn the things about what makes a good product, the relationship between benefits and detriments in a product, the concepts of, of workarounds, the consumer use cycle, all of these things. And if you go to the blog, there's 1,500 articles on this stuff, all for free. Read your hearts out. I write about this stuff every day. You have to understand those things so that you can make a good product. And nine times out of 10, probably 9.9 .9 times out of 10, the problem an inventor's having and not getting licensing is because their product simply doesn't make any sense. It isn't consumer viable. Or in some case, it defies physics. <laughs> Step one, we've got to go learn what makes a good product. That's our foundation. Step two, we got to figure out what kind of neighborhood this product's going to live in. Now, a couple years ago, I moved to Charleston, South Carolina. Anybody here ever been to Charleston? It's a great town. I'd never been to Charleston before. Just moved there on a whim. I could have gone gotten a realtor 
or looked around and found a house and bought it and moved in. But I wouldn't know how far the grocery store was. I wouldn't know how far the fire department was. I wouldn't have known any of those things. It later would very, become very important to me. The same is true with the neighborhood that your product is going to live in. So to do that, we first have to understand that neighborhood. We have to understand the market. So we conduct what we call a market audit. Now this is not rocket science. What I'm looking for here are things that match functionally my idea or my product. I say functionally. One of the most important things an inventor can ever do is understand the concepts of functional inventing. In functional inventing, we strip away the paradigms. What's the functional, um, the core function of a water bottle? Portability. I'm sorry? Portability. Portability. Hold water. Functional invention of a, or functional, core function of a water bottle. Containment of mass and orderly movement of mass has nothing to do with water. It's a containment and orderly movement of mass. That's its core function. So I would, I would present to you that a 55-gallon drum is also a water bottle, as is a kid's juicy box or a milk carton or a beer pitcher. They are all water bottles. So if I asked you 20 minutes ago to invent me a new water bottle, I guarantee you would have come back with these clones of what you social, sociologically think is a water bottle. And real inventors, especially good product inventors, learn to strip all that away and look at the core function of that product. Because that's going to unshackle your mind to create a better water bottle. So the core function is what we're looking for in this market audit. So here I've got examples of pizza cutters. So I'm going to look for every pizza cutter on the market that I can find. And I'm going to just make a simple chart. And I'm going to find out the retailer they're selling in, the package type they're using, the size and weight, the display kind, the color, all of that information and their price. And I'm going to matrix all that out, and I'm going to get myself about a 30,000 foot view of the pizza cutter market. Then I'm going to take a look at my pizza cutter, and I'm going to compare it to the market. Now there might be 50 pizza cutters out there, so I have to be honest with myself and ask myself the question, does the world really need 51? And the answer to that is probably no. And I have to have the fortitude as an inventor to walk away from my great pizza cutter idea if the market shows me that the consumers are currently being serviced well. Now, if I don't find any pizza cutters out there, that's every bit as troubling a, an answer. Because now I have to find out why. And that's normally about first sale versus second sale versus subsequent sale. There's a lot of dynamics that go into why something as, obviously, as obvious as a pizza cutter may not actually be out there. It's up to you to find that out. You will never know that until you do this process. One of the most important pieces of this is the pricing because that's how we develop an MSRP. MSRP is not just a number you come up with or, as most inventors think, you start working backwards from your manufacturing cost. It has nothing to do with that. An MSRP is the amount of pain the consumer is willing to experience. They're telling you how much a pizza cutter is worth to them. So at the end of all this, I'm going to take my idea for a pizza cutter, I'm going to compare it to each one of these, and I'm going to write down a couple of things mine does better and a couple of things mine does worse. Because I have to figure out where in this strata of $5.95 to $31.95, those are the numbers the consumer has told me they're willing to bear for that solution. Because my pizza cutter may look like a pizza cutter, but what it is is actually just a wrapper for a solution to a problem my consumers have. 
My consumer's pizza is huge. They need to make it smaller. I've given them a way to make it smaller. That's it. They have a problem. They look around for a solution to the problem. They can't find that solution at home. They go to the repository of solutions, Walmart. The great repository of solutions, because that's all a retailer is. It is a giant warehouse of solutions. I go in there, I look around for my solution, I can't find an adequate solution, I go home, my problem didn't disappear. It's still here. So I gotta solve it on my own, and next thing you know, I'm at the Tampa Bay Inventors Group. Because that's how we all got here. We found a problem there was no solution to, so we came up with one. Understanding what the consumer is willing to pay for the solution you came up with to their problem, hugely important in all of this. Because none of the rest of it matters. That's your starting point. I don't care how much you paid for manufacturing, I don't care how much your website cost, I don't care how much the titanium you decided to make it out of was. This is what will, will be supported and you have to work within those numbers. And unless you conduct an audit, you don't know what those numbers are. And if you ever do make it to a retailer and you don't have this kind of backup to support your, your MSRP, they're going to laugh at you, they're going to be very nice about it, they're going to shake your hand and wish you well, and you're never getting in there again, I promise. Because they don't have time for it. And there's 15 other people just like you lined up down the hall who did take the time to do this kind of research. So in step two, we're going to understand the market. We're going to make sure that the world needs my idea or my product. And we're going to be honest with ourselves. I don't care what your dog told you. You have to be honest with yourself. Based on what you found in that audit, does the world really need your product? If it doesn't, you stop and you move to your next one and you do this process again. But if you're not honest with yourself, you're just gonna go down a path that's going nowhere. And that's really, really important. So in step three, we gotta check ourselves. We know what our problem is, we know the solution we came up with, we know what the market says about it. Now it's time to really take stock of what we're saying. We're all the way to step four and nobody's even mentioned the word patent. Not once. Why? Because getting a patent on your great idea is not the most important thing you can do, I assure you. There is no, zero, nine, nada, whatever language you want to say, no correlation between patent protection and commercial viability of a product. Nothing. It's just how we feel as individuals and all the war stories we hear and all this, the, the you know, horrible things we hear about people stealing our inventions that make us want to run from the shower, towel off, and go to the patent office. But that's actually not how it's done. Once we understand our idea, once we understand the solution it's solving, and once we understand what the market says about it, then we're going to look for it. Because up until that point, I didn't have to talk to anybody. I didn't have to write anything down, other than maybe my notebook. I didn't have to go take a survey. I didn't have to do anything. So protection up until this step hasn't been really on the radar, because I'm just quietly doing my research. So these are the three prominent ways we're going to protect it. And they go from free to cheap to more expensive. The cheapest way you can protect your idea is shut your mouth. Be careful about who you talk to and when you do explain things, write down who you talk to in the environment, the date in which you talk to these people. Keep a record. Just keep it in the back of your notebook. 
That'll be very important later on if you ever have to do something legal with your invention, even licensing it out. Say you have a company that says, man, this is great, but our attorney wants to know who you've told. Oh, here you go. Here's everybody I discussed it with. That's important. An NDA. Anybody downloaded an NDA off the internet? Come on. Bad, 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 bad idea. Why is downloading an NDA off the internet a bad idea? Because the enforcement of NDAs is done state by state, not federally. So some states have things in the NDA that they have to have for that NDA to be a legal document. So if I download an NDA off the internet that I found on ndas.com, and I try and enforce it in the state of South Carolina, it may or may not hold any water. NDAs create trade secrets. Trade secrets are about civil liability that's done under contract law at the state level. Not like a patent which is done at the federal level. An NDA is enforced at the state level. So you have to have an NDA that works in the state in which you reside. And the best way to get that is to go to an attorney, spend a few bucks saying, write me an NDA that is enforceable in the state of Florida. You only have to do it once because then you can fill in the blanks on the NDA all day long. But at least then you know the one you're using will protect you should you ever need it. And of course a patent, everybody wants to get a patent. Anybody have any idea what an uncommercialized idea is? It's a hobby. Anybody have any idea what a patented uncommercialized idea is? An expensive hobby. An expensive hobby. Mm -hmm. That's right. The average cost of a U.S. patent, a utility patent, is about $12,000. That's $12,000 that I'm going to give you for a less than 50-50 shot that three and a half years from now it will award. Something about that doesn't add up. I would be looking for cheaper ways to gain protection for my invention than running off and filing a utility patent. That may make you feel good. That may sound really cool at your next dinner party. But mathematically, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You have to understand how these tools work and have what you need for your situation. The vast majority of people licensing a product out to a manufacturer should file for a provisional patent application right before they're ready to start approaching companies so that you have that full 12 months to work with. If after 12 months you haven't licensed it out, chances are you need to go back to the drawing board and figure out what's wrong with your product. But like all legal things, you should contact your attorney and ask for legal advice. It's really important. Step five, we need to understand some terms. A manufacturer is one who makes products. Couldn't tell you the number of times I hear inventors go, oh, well, I'm gonna license this to Target. Really? Let me know how that works out. Target doesn't license things, neither do any retailers. Manufacturers who make products license things. A contract is a set of divorce papers. That's what it is. Contracts are great when you first write them because everybody's in love. You write the contract for that time when you're not in love anymore. We see this all the time when two neighbors get together over a bottle of wine on a Friday night and by 10.30 they've got the next great invention of the world. By Sunday they're at each other's throats. We see this constantly. You have to have a contract and understand the role that contract plays in this process. It is your divorce decree. A licensor, one who grants a license, that would be you. You're going to grant a license. A licensee is one who assumes a license. 
that would be the company you're approaching. Remember, we said licensing is like renting or leasing. It's a temporary authority. In fact, it's really just a temporary authority saying, I won't go beat you up. Right? It's not really giving them the right to do anything. It's telling them that when they do do it, you won't go beat them up. That's the crooks of a licensing agreement. And a royalty is a percent of per unit value. So now, we've got our market audit, we've protected it, we understand the terms of the world we live in in licensing. <clears throat> Now we need to develop a little sell sheet. Anyone ever seen a real retail sell sheet? It's a very complicated form. It has a lot of information on it and it is done in a very specific way. That is not what we're talking about. This is, a co this is an example of a normal retail sell sheet. We're talking about a manufacturer sell sheet. So in a manufacturer's sell sheet, what do we got? We got a picture. Now that picture could be a photograph of your prototype. It could be an artist rendering. It could be whatever you want. It could be a hand-drawn sketch if that's all you've got to work with. We've got a little paragraph here that kind of explains things. We've got a few bullet points, the capabilities of the product. And we've got your contact information and maybe your current patent status. And you'd be amazed at how many inventors do a sell sheet and never put their name on it. It's amazing. And that's all we've got. And when we contact the manufacturer and say, hey, we've got an idea we'd like you to look at, this is all we send them. Now think about that from a protection standpoint. I can tell you a whole lot about the fact that I'm building a motorboat without tell you, telling you how I'm building a motorboat. The fact that I'm building a motorboat is not rocket science. My invention is in how I built the motorboat. So we're not telling you how I built this year. We're not telling you those things. And understand that the less sophisticated your idea is, the less this theory applies, right? This is a pizza shearer. You don't have to tell me what you're doing to, for me to know how to build one. But if you have a relatively complicated product, you're not giving away how you did it, you're just saying that you did it and what the benefits of doing it were. So we're going to take this sell sheet and now we're going shopping. In step seven, we're going shopping. Why are we going shopping? Because the federal government is your friend. And the federal government passed a law that says <clears throat> all manufacturers or distributors of retail products must mark them with their names. So I get this question all the time. Well, how do I get Nicole or know what company to approach? Go shopping. Go to the aisle that has all the stuff that's most like your idea. Take the packages, flip them over, and take a, pack, a picture of that information with your cell phone. Because if this is a product that's closest to my idea, chances are this guy is the guy who I'm going to license it to. And the information's right there for me. You'd be amazed at how much stuff on an aisle is done by one or two companies. It's amazing. So I'm going to go shopping with my audit data and I'm going to start looking for products that are close proximity to mine or solve the same core function as mine. And I'm going to get the distributor or manufacturer information off the back of those packages and I'm going to go home and I'm going to put them in the spreadsheet. Then I'm going to have a pretty good starting place to contact the companies that I think might license this product from me. Then I'm going to contact each company. Hi, I've developed a product. After seeing that you distribute or manufacture these products in this category, I wonder if you had a process for submitting products to your company for review. Wow. It's kind of intuitive. 
if a company has a process for submitting products to them for review, show them enough respect to use it. If they do not, ask them how you go about submitting something. If they say yes, ask them if they mind signing your NDA. That's not going to hurt. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Keep in mind, that NDA is a contract. And if someone called you up one afternoon and you were watching as the world turns and went and answered the phone, and they said, do you mind entering into a contract with me? How likely are you to say yes? But they have to protect your information contractually for the length of that NDA. I hear that a lot too. Well, if a company was really serious, they wouldn't have an expiration date on their NDA. Really? Think about that for a second. How could they reasonably protect that data with changing employees for the next 100 years? They couldn't do it. That's why an NDA has a date on it. It has to be reasonable to enforce it. Otherwise, it's not even a contract. So, if they don't, want to sign your NDA, that doesn't mean they're crooked or they want to steal your idea or they're jerks. It probably means their attorney won't let them do that with people that just are voices on the other end of the phone. So if they say no, respectfully, respectfully thank them for their time and hang up. Now this is a really, really, really important word. Why? Because I don't know if you've noticed, but we got a lot of nut jobs in this business. We got some real nut jobs. Right? So we have to be respectful to those companies because we're representing our whole industry. And think about this. Say you call up Coleman Camping Products and you've got a great product. But 20 minutes before you called, some nut job called. And they thought they had a great product too. And they threatened to burn this guy's house down because he wouldn't sign their NDA. How likely are you to get your product into the, that company? So we have to act with respect because we don't know who we're following or who's going to follow us. And that's what the business world expects. They expect us to have done our homework, to know what we're doing, to understand what they need as new products, and to act with respect. Eventually, you are going to get a licensing contract. I all but guarantee it. Because this is a process. And we're going to do the process over and over again until we get good at it, and eventually you will get a licensing contract. When that happens, you have to fully understand the terms in that contract. Now, if you've been doing this and you're on your 20th licensing contract, pretty much you're going to see a lot of the same stuff over and over again. But at least for your first few licensing contracts, you should be working with an attorney. An attorney is there to help you. Now, how many people would take their licensing contract to their patent attorney? That's like taking your dog to your dentist. With all difference to my good friends in the patent attorney business, they're not contract attorneys. Contract law is different than patent law. I wouldn't take my, my patent needs to my contract attorney. Find yourself one of each. Someone who can handle your intellectual property issues and someone who can work with you in, in negotiating a contract. There are certain things that go into these contracts that should be there. But if your attorney has never licensed anything in terms of retail products, he's probably not going to know how much of that works. So you're going to have to dig in and find some things. Each one of these contracts should have these three pillars. We have the pillar that says, I want some upfront money. Why do we want upfront money? Why should the manufacturer have to pay us upfront money? So they're committed. So they're committed? Because depending on how complicated your product is, it might take a year and a half ever to see a store shelf. 
that's a lot of opportunity loss. Because the minute, the minute I sign this contract with this person, and somebody walks in and hands me a giant bag of money for my idea, I've got to say no. Because I've already signed a contract. So this upfront money could come in a couple of different ways. Often, inventors will do it as an advance on their royalties. But you don't have to do it as an advance on your royalties. It's like earnest money. Show me you're serious. Show me you've got what it takes and give me enough money in this contract that if two months from now somebody comes along and offers me a bag of money and I gotta turn them down, I don't feel so bad. That's business. Oftentimes we recommend to inventors that they exercise options. You can do an option on an invention, a licensed invention all the time, just like a, an author does it or a playwright does an option. You see somebody come out with a good book, I guarantee there's half a dozen movie companies that are optioning that book. And what they're saying is, I'll give you a bunch of money for the right to use, turn that book into a, into a, a movie anytime within the next 12 months. If at the end of 12 months, I've decided not to make a movie out of it, you're still keeping the money. Options are very normal. They're, they're done with, with creative stuff all the time. I've used them in licensing. They're a good tool. They're basically saying, I gotta sit around and wait on you to get your act together before I could make any money. That's worth something to me. Your royalty payment. So there is what's called a national royalty guide and your contract attorney will have this. It's a book. And it lays out what all the royalty guides are for everything from music to books to whatever. And the average royalty across the board is eight points, eight percent. That's the average. Now, let's put that in perspective for you. I've done licensing deals where I got 10 percent. I've never seen a licensing deal above 10 percent. I've seen lots of licensing deals right around 6 percent, which is where most of them will fall. Except if you're doing an as seen on TV product where the licensing will be down around two and a half percent. Performance guarantee is the third pillar of any licensing contract. That says to me, I don't care if you sell one or a million, I'm getting paid for this, no matter what you do. Now it's their right once they control that product, once they control your invention. It's their right to do with it what they want. If you don't have a performance guarantee built into your license contract, they can throw it in the drawer. And you're going to think that 10 years license deal they gave you was huge until you realize why they really gave it to you. So that's basically minimum uh, payment. It is. So how do we calculate that? One of the things that most inventors never do is check out these companies to see what kind of distribution channels they have. Because I guarantee these companies all talk big. But do they really have distribution? And without distribution, the product's going nowhere. No matter whether they license it to you or not. So what we look for in minimum performance is a percentage of possible distribution. So. I'm going to license my thing to Company X, and Company X sells to Home Depot, and Home Depot has 700 stores. A retailer like a Home Depot sell maybe a product, a product and a half per week across 700 stores. So that's maybe 1,100 pieces a week. So if I know that, then I can extrapolate that into how much distribution this company should be able to get. And my minimum performance can be about 60, 70% of that. Not 100%, but 60, 70%. And I can do that. Oh, you sell to Home Depot, you sell to Lowe's, you sell to Menards, you know, like products, similar products in those stores are moving a piece and a half a week. Now just do the math. You'll figure out pretty closely what it's going to do. Now, how do you know they're moving a piece and a half a week? Well, you got to get creative. 
So you might walk in and ask for the store manager and you might say, hey, look, I'm an inventor and I'm trying to figure this stuff out. Could you run a movement report on this SKU for me? Because this SKU is the closest to, the, to your product. And they'll most of the time go, sure. And they'll run the report. It's called a movement report. And what it is is a number of pieces that went across the scanner. And they'll go, oh, well, that sold three pieces last week. Or it's averaging 1.7 pieces a week. Oh, okay, great. Well, your product's going to probably do pretty close to that. So now you've got something to start with the math. Now you've got some way to start calculating what this company you're licensing to should be able to do in performance. You need to understand this reality. Most of the time you will fail. Say it with me. I'm going to fail. Come on. I'm going to fail. We're going to fail. Most of the time we're going to fail. That is the reality of this. No matter how long you've been doing it, you will always fail far more than you will succeed. You have to embrace that. You have to understand that because otherwise it will beat you down. And you can't let it beat you down. Just because you get a deal doesn't mean anything. It's true. There's a lot of ways that deal can go south. A lot of ways. The better you did your job, the more they will respect you. And the more they will respect you, the better deal you will get. That's a simple concept, isn't it? They do their job every day. They had to get good at their jobs. They expect us to do the same thing. Protect your invention the best you can, but not having a patent is not a deal breaker. No matter what some goof with a, you know, some self-proclaimed expert may tell you, it's not a deal breaker. People license unpatented products all the time. So let's do the math here. Understanding what a good product is, well, that's free. Conducting a market on it, well, wait, that's free too. If you have someone do a search for previous patents for you, you might spend a hundred bucks doing a rudimentary search. You're not doing a deep dive. If you learn what a good search is, then you can do it yourself. Have a rendering done, this got all messed up. Study the terms and the process, that's free. Have a rendering done. If you want your sales sheet to look even reasonably professional, have a rendering done. It's no big deal. Most of this stuff is relatively free. And if you did a provisional patent application on your own, which we said was really just a, a tool to build a little value, get the cheapest form of protection you can and let them pay for it, negotiate it into your license deal. If their attorneys really think they need it, let them pay for it. You're still going to be the inventor on it. Paying for the patent doesn't make you the inventor. You can see most of this stuff is really inexpensive. So I hear this all the time. Oh, I really want to license my thing, but I need to get an investor. Why? I have friends in the business that license professionally. It's all they do, and they never spend more than 50 or 100 bucks on any of it. Because you don't have to. If you take the time to learn the processes. So we're going to do these steps. We're going to find a good solution to a big problem, right? Because a good solution to a small problem doesn't give you commercial viability. A good solution to a big problem gives you commercial viability. You're going to understand the core function of your product or idea because that's going to help us make a good product. You're going to make sure you know what makes a good product. We're going to understand the principles of benefit and detriment, the consumer workaround, consumer use cycle, the value index, all these things that are tools that we use to understand why consumers embrace some products and not others. We're going to conduct a market audit to see if the world really needs one. And we're going to be honest enough with ourselves with that answer. 
We're going to protect the idea the best and the cheapest way we can. We're going to produce a quick manufacturer sell sheet. We're going to go shopping for contacts. Respectfully, we're going to contact these manufacturers. That's a really, really important part. I've been doing this a lot of years. I'm tired of dealing with nut jobs. We don't have to be nut jobs, and we don't have to be seen by the world as nut jobs. We just have to be respectful and dial down the emotion a little bit. We have to understand what we're signing, and we do that by contacting an attorney who went to law school, not somebody you met on a forum somewhere. And then we're going to repeat these steps over and over again. Because this is a process, and I don't care what widget you put in it, the process doesn't change. This is really important statement, I say this all the time. So, when we talk about assigning a patent, we're talking about formally and legally changing the ownership of that patent. There is only one way, known to man, to change officially the ownership of a patent and that's through assignment. If I leave you my patent in my will, it does not give you ownership. If I write an IOU at a bar, it does not give you ownership. If I have a big contract drawn up saying you now own my patent, it does not give you ownership. There is only one way to change ownership of a U.S. patent, and that is an assignment at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and the registration of that assignment. That's it. If you don't do that, you did not change the ownership. However, if you did do that, you did change the ownership. There is no reason to ever assign a patent as part of a licensing process. None. Because the licensing contract is a pseudo assignment. It's rental. I leased you the right to do this. If I go and rent a house, does the landlord sign the deed over to me? No. We sign a contract that gives the terms by which I'm going to rent the property. That's all a licensing agreement is. So why would you sign the deed? That makes no sense. What about uh, the, uh, the leasing exclusively and non-exclusive? So, if I'm a company and I'm working in sporting goods and you have a tape that you invented, some kind of an adhesive tape, and you want to license it to me, you're going to license it to me for use in sporting goods. I'm not going to own the right to do what I want to do with that in automotive. We license in verticals. So you decide what vertical that company has distribution in and that's the parameter of your license deal. So it is exclusive in the fact that I'm not going to sign this deal with you if you're trying to peddle it to three of my competitors. Okay, so you're only going to get one person in sporting goods. But you can get one person in sporting goods and turn right around and license it to someone in automotive. That's not competitive in nature, it's done all the time. This is a really important thing because we're seeing more and more inventors fall prey to this as companies are using these large patent portfolios as monetary instruments. And, and this can apply. I mean, you may have had your patent for five or six years. And now all of a sudden, because you didn't read the document, all of a sudden someone else has a right to it. And that's not to say these companies do it in every case. There's just no reason to give them the right to do it. It doesn't make sense. InventorOpinion.com is a daily inventor education blog. Been writing this blog for eight years now, Monday through Friday. It's over 1,500 articles. On the right hand side, you will see a keyword search box. Search on these terms, right? Go in there, punch it in, and see the articles that pop up on these things that you have questions about. It's free, no one's ever gonna charge you a penny for it. And there's a lot of good information in there that can save you a lot of problems. 
There's also a Facebook group for the Inventor blog where you can ask questions and people will get on there and answer them. We monitor it very closely, so no one's ever going to sell you anything on that group. Nobody's ever going to put out information that isn't, isn't accurate because we, we make sure that nobody does that. And, and it's really important, but there's several patent attorneys that hang out in that group. There's several professional inventors that hang out in the group and answer questions. Try and make all this education very safe for you. Because at the end of the day, we as inventors, when we crash that plane, our family's sitting in the back seat. They want to support us. And they're the first ones who will lie to us. They'll tell us how smart we are and how great that was. Because they love us. So it's our, it's our responsibility to know what we're doing. Whether you get that because you come to a group like this or because you read a blog article or whatever, it doesn't make any difference. We just try and make sure that the information is out there for you.